So, hello everybody uh, and good afternoon, depending what time zone you're in, maybe good morning. And uh, thank Paul for inviting me to the uh, Larchmont Library. Uh, we've done programs before and uh, I always enjoy uh, actually physically being in the Larchmont Library because it's one of the closer ones to me in terms of driving. It takes me about eight minutes to get there. You and Bronxville are my two favorites for that. Um, my name is Evan Weiner. Uh, I am a reporter. Uh, I started when I was 15 years old, and I'll give you the background. I was at Spring Valley High School uh, in Rockland County in Muncie, New York, and I was in 11th grade, and I had a teacher by the name of Joe Dionisio, G Dionisio who I still see 49 years later, or I did before COVID-19, over at the State Line Diner in Mawa with some of the old Spring Valley and Ramapo High School teachers. And he said to me, you got a good voice. Student, you got a good voice. Called everybody student. And I said, um, thank you. And he said, how would you like to be on radio? I said, I'd be on radio the worst way, the worst way possible. And I was. Um, we did a show called Tiger Talk, Spring Valley Tigers. It was on every Tuesday afternoon at 3.45 on WRKL 910 on your AM radio dial, 1,000 watts of power, and for 15 minutes each week, we talked about Spring Valley High School. It was a terrible show. But Joe opened doors for me because I got to work uh, with the Nyack Journal News. Among the things I did there was take Little League results and also the Hackensack record. In 1978, six years later, I'm a year ahead of school, so I graduated in June of 1977. Got a job with a 500-watt radio station, WGRC in Nanuet. Um, Steve North was my boss. He hired me and he said, you have to work Saturdays, which didn't really bother me because uh, among the first assignments I got, and I'm 21, got big hairdo and all the other stuff when I'm 21, uh, Rockland Community College ran a speaker series monthly, and Ralph Nader was one of the first people I ever spoke to, uh, along with Julian Bond. But it's March of 1978. I'm still 21 years old. And Steve says, you got to go down to the Tappan Zee townhouse. The uh, New York State Democrats are having uh, a fundraiser there, local uh, party convention. And uh, don't worry about filing anything until Monday. Just you know, go there and get some interviews. So I walk into the place, and the first guy I see is uh, Jerome Nadler. You might have heard of Jerry Nadler. Jerry Nadler, the uh, then obscure assemblyman from New York City, uh, eventually uh, was one of the house managers during the recent impeachment trial. Uh, also walked in, Hugh Carey, he was running for governor. Uh, Mario Cuomo, running for lieutenant governor, came in, and he, he brought his family with him. He had his teenage son, who's two years younger than me, Andrew, and his little kid, uh, Chris Cuomo there, and he had his wife, Matilda, and his daughters. Uh, and um, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan was there as well. In fact, I spoke to him quite often. And uh, then there was this tall guy who walked in, about six foot four, good looking guy, sandy, sandy, brownish hair, gray hair. And he walks up to me and says, I like you. Didn't even introduce himself to me, I like you. And I looked at him, and I knew who he was. I watched Batman. He was Gotham City's mayor at one time, John Lindsay. And Lindsay says to me, um, I want to tell you something. Said, hey, tell me what you want. And he's running for Senate in New York, 1980. I got my scoop. I'm done for the day. Run back to my radio station. File the story. File it with the Associated Press. File it with UPI, United Press International. And I get a call from WNEW Radio in New York. And uh, some of you probably remember the AM side with William B. Williams and Ted Brown and Duke uh, Ellington and Ella Fitzgerald and Frank Sinatra and Tony Bennett and Peggy Lee and, and Sammy and uh, Bobby Darren, all those singers. And the FM was the rock side. It's Henry Marcotte. And Henry Marcotte uh, says, uh, we'd like to buy that story from you. Okay, how much are you going to pay me? Ten bucks. Sold. And with that, I was on WNEW Radio in New York uh, for three and a half years. Um, and um, it propelled me into this career, um, which propelled me into other areas. Now, I have a very unique look or a very, I uh, have a rather unique aspect in looking at uh, this particular talk. Um, I worked with Marty Glickman in the 1980s, got to know Marty rather well. I knew Sam Stoller, who ran the Milrose Games, he was the guy who operated the Milrose Games, and I interviewed Gretel Berkman. 
Gretel Bergman, that was in 1993. And uh, Marty Glickman, Sam Stoller, and Gretel Bergman were denied, because they were Jewish, they were denied the opportunity to participate in the 1936 Berlin Olympics, the Hitler Olympics. Um, Marty was bitter. Sam was kind of nonplussed, he never really talked about it. And Gretel Bergman had a great story for me. And as, as we get into this talk, uh, I'll talk about that. I also talked a little bit about the 1972 Munich Olympics where nine Israeli athletes were killed and uh, two coaches were killed. And from the viewpoint of being friendly with Howard Cosell, which, which I was and uh, I still am friendly with two of his grandsons, um, Justin and Colin, uh, Justin and Colin, and uh, also from Mark Spitz's viewpoint. I interviewed Mark Spitz in 1999 about that. Uh, so that's where I come from with, with this talk. So I got five people who were involved in the two Olympics that uh, I interviewed or knew, and I'm going to share that with you. Now, you probably don't know those people, particularly the guy on the right, Jeremiah Mahoney. The guy on the left is Avery Brundage. And uh, I first became familiar with Avery Brundage by going to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. And I'm reading every plaque, everybody who is honored, every plaque going back and forth. And they're mostly, they're all Jewish names, except for one guy, this guy, Jeremiah Mahoney, Judge Jeremiah Mahoney. And in 1935, on November 8th, 1935, Jeremiah Mahoney said, there is no way we should, or it was December 8th, 1935, not November 8th, December 8th, 1935. There is absolutely no way we should be going to the Olympics in Germany and justifying Adolf Hitler as a leader. Things were going on. Now, my mother-in-law, Harriet's uh, aunt, Harriet J.G. Breslin, came to these talks, I gave these talks back in the, in, in the 1990s and 2000s. She came to these talks and she said, how come you knew about this? How come other people knew about this, what was going on in Germany? And she was 14, 15 years old at the time, and I never knew anything. I said, why didn't you know anything? She said, we never talked about it. And this is the story of the 1936 Olympics, the Hitler Olympics. Jeremiah Mahoney there is on the right, and on the left is Avery Brundage, who was the head of the United States Olympic Committee. And Mahoney was the head of the Amateur Athletic Association, Amateur Athletic Union of the United States. In 1931, going back to 1931, and let's go back to the end of World War I. World War I, the treaties that, came, that people came up with, Woodrow Wilson and, and the enemies of Germany in those days, France and England, basically the treaties were to starve Germany and to isolate Germany after the war. By 1931, let's not starve Germany anymore. Let's not isolate them anymore. Let's welcome Germany back into the family of nations. And the way we'll do that, we'll give them the Winter Olympics in Munich in 1936, and we'll give them the Summer Olympics in Berlin. Uh, the choice single that Germany was going to accept the Olympics, and it would mark the return to Germany, to the world community, after all these years of isolation after World War I. That would change by 1933. The Nazi party leader Adolf Hitler became the chancellor of Germany and basically turned the democracy into a one-party dictatorship, which would persecute Jews, uh, gypsies, the Roma people, all political opponents, and others. And the Nazi claim to control all aspects of German life also extended to sports. Now, there was a lot of anti-Semitism in Europe in the 1920s. You didn't need Germany for that. Uh, you could pick up newspapers in the 1920s, and the cartoonists would depict Jews with hooked noses and spindly fingers or looking like mice. Uh, the Groucho Marx character, where he bent over, stooped over, using his fingers uh, with the cigar as the prop, was the caricature 
of what the, Euro the Europeans looked at, at Jews. And uh, the Jews decided to fight back. And the way they did was to create the Maccabee Games, which would be in Haifa in the Middle East in 1932. So there are all kinds of things that are going on in Europe with Jews, uh, with anti-Semitism. Germany wasn't part of that quite yet, quite yet. But 1933, things would change. In fact, um, a number of years ago, I gave this talk up at, uh, in Stanford, Connecticut. And there was a man who was in his 90s or so at that point. It's not that long ago, five, six years ago. And uh, he was telling me, he was a teenager in uh, Germany, 1933. So he was born around 1920, 21. And he said his parents, his father was a newspaper editor. And uh, his parents, when he turned 13, sent him to live with relatives in England. Why? They were afraid about what was going on. Giving you all of this as a backdrop to Gretel Bergman. So he went there uh, in 1933, but he did occasionally come to see his uh, father. The image, the image of Germany in the 1930s was to promote uh, the myth of the Aryan racial superiority and physical prowess. In sculpture and other art forms, German artists idealized athletes as well-developed muscular tone, heroic strength, and accentuated Aryan facial features. You know, Hitler didn't have any Aryan facial features, but he thought the good-looking Germans all had blonde hair and blue eyes and were well-built men and well-built women. This was this is what he, he thought uh, the Germans would look like. But there were Jews who were excellent athletes. Uh, Eric Selig was one of those excellent athletes who got knocked down and basically drummed out of the German boxing club because in 1933, in April of 1933, Aryans only policy was instituted in all of German organizations, athletic organizations, except for one person. I'll get to that one person in a minute. Non-Aryans, Jews or individuals with Jewish parents and Romers, gypsies were systematically excluded from German sports facilities and associations. Actually, there were two Jews that were not thrown out. The German Boxing Association uh, expelled the professional light heavyweight champion, Eric Siegel, in April 1933. Reason? Simple. He was Jewish. And that is uh, Penn, the tennis player, Daniel Preen, rather, Preen, the tennis player. The Germany's top-ranked tennis player was removed from Germany's tennis Davis Cup tennis team. Now, Gretel Bergman was expelled from her German club in 1933, known in the United States as Margaret Lambert. However, however, because she was a world-class high jumper and probably the best athlete, male or female, in all of Europe, she was allowed to continue to compete, despite the fact that she had Jewish parents. A fencer by the name of Helene Meyer was also able to go ahead she was a great athlete, even though her father was Jewish. We'll talk about her in a few minutes. Uh, and that's Ernest Jankey. Ernest Jankey was an International Olympic Committee delegate. Uh, and he was of German descent. And he knew what was going on in Germany. My mother-in-law didn't know what was going on. I said, Jankey knew? I said that uh, Mahoney knew? Al Smith knew? James Curley knew. A lot of people knew that was going on in Germany. But a lot of Jews who've seen this talk, who were of a certain age, who remembered back in the 1930s, this is 20 years ago, said they never heard any of this. How come they didn't hear any of it? Jenke was an American International Olympic Committee delegate who expressed outrage with reports of what was happening within Hitler's Germany. And by November 25th, 1935, he sent a letter to the International Olympic Committee president, and they're all lords and they're all counts because they're all out of work uh, royalty. This happened to be Henri Belay Latour, Count Henri Belay Latour. And they floated the idea, they, Janky and his backers, floated the idea of an initial American boycott of the 1936 Berlin Games. This is in November of 1935, all in reaction to what was going on uh, in Germany. 
1933, 34, and 35. The letters was this. Neither Americans nor the representatives of other countries can take part in the games in Nazi Germany without at least acquiescing in the contempt of the Nazis for fair play in their sordid exploitation of the games. The letter went unanswered. Jenke was the former assistant secretary for the United States Navy. He was of German descent, and he would be thrown out of the exclusive club called the International Olympic Committee by July of 1936. And his spot was taken by a former Olympic athlete by the name of Avery Brundage. Avery Brundage was an art collector, and he was also in the construction business. Avery Brundage was also a member of the America First Committee. Avery Brundage had a lot of baggage when he joined the Olympic Committee permanently in 1936. December 8, 1935, Jeremiah Mahoney delivers a talk. Again, my mother-in-law, who I spoke to at length about this, had no idea that this even happened. She wasn't paying attention, but a lot of people a lot of people weren't paying attention to Mahoney either. He was a judge in New York. Mahoney's concern. In April 1933, an Aryans only policy was instituted in all German athletic organizations. Non Aryans, Jews, or individuals with Jewish parents or Romans, gypsies, were systematically excluded from German sports facilities and associations. Subsequently, rights were taken away, and more rights were taken away, and more rights were taken away. And uh, Mahoney was looking at this and says, there is no way we could support going over to Germany. We can't do this because we can't legitimize the Nazi regime. We just can't do it. If we send a team there, we're legitimizing Hitler and we're recognizing Hitler as a world leader. We should not be doing this. This too falls on deaf ears. There's no room for discrimination on grounds of race, color, or creed in the Olympics. The Amateur Athletic Association, of which Mahoney was the head, voted in 1933 to accept an invitation to compete in Berlin in 1936, provided that Germany, and this is prior to Adolf Hitler taking uh, the reins, provided that Germany uh, would pledge that there would be no discrimination against Jewish athletes. If that pledge is not kept, and it wasn't kept, I personally do not see why we should compete. Now, getting back to that man in Germany uh, who went to England, who was at my talk at Stanford, he told me he went to see his parents in 1936. His parents had moved to uh, what would be Czechoslovakia by this point uh, in Prague. And I never asked him what happened to his parents. And he said that during the Olympics, the lead up to the Olympics, he was able to go through Germany and there wasn't a problem. Nobody called him any names or anything else. But when he returned after the Olympics, it was back to dirty Jew, and he got spit upon, and he got back to England. He would come to the United States and go to Columbia University by 1940 or so, the guy. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, what is his role in all of this? You know, Jimmy Carter boycotted the 1980 Olympics. The anniversary of that was a couple of days ago. And Franklin Roosevelt did listen to Mahoney a little bit and Janky. But ultimately, he didn't do anything. In fact, he thought that the team should go to Germany, even though that they were going to give Germany legitimacy. Um, Marty Glickman was one of those athletes who would go to Germany. So would Sam Stoller from the American team. Roosevelt urged the American team, go to the Berlin Games, don't worry about it, and go win some gold medals. Now, this is the first time in the history of the modern Olympics, which weren't really that old by that point because they started in the late 19th century, that people in the United States and some people in Europe would call for the boycott of the Olympics because of what later would be known as human rights abuses in subsequent Olympics. They didn't call them human rights abuses in 1936. But um, that would be, in 1936, human rights abuses aimed at Jews, gypsies, or Romers, homosexuals, and Adolf Hitler's political opponents. But Avery Brundage had assurances. Avery Brundage became the head of the American uh, delegation, 
and he personally met with the Fuhrer. And the Fuhrer said, we will treat everybody equally. In the Olympics, you have nothing to worry about. And that was backed up by that guy from Stanford, Connecticut, who said he easily went through Germany in 1936. The Nazis were going to put on a good show. Why? Because they were going to try to impress the world that all was okay with Adolf Hitler and uh, all was okay with Goebbels and, and all of the other people that were connected to the German government. So they toned it down. Uh, by 1936, when the Olympics started, the Nazi regime tried to camouflage its violent racist policies while it hosted the Summer Olympics. Most of the anti-Jewish signs were temporarily taken down. Newspapers toned down the harsh rhetoric, including the cartoons, which depicted Jews and looking like rats. It was all an illusion. The Berlin Games, the Berlin Games was going to be presented to foreign spectators and journalists with a false image of Hitler in Germany were peaceful and tolerant of other people. And it was a propaganda win. 49, station, 49 nations sent teams to Germany and it legitimized the Hitler regime in both the eyes of the world and Germany's domestic audiences. And Adolf Hitler took it as, hey, they like me on the political stage. I don't have any problems on the political stage. It was a propaganda coup. Now, the Germans started planning this propaganda coup back in 1935. Uh, television was revving up. The United States started with its television experiment in 1923. By 1927, there was a picture tube. England also was going ahead with its television experiment. It was in the Westinghouse laboratories and the General Electric laboratories in the United States. TV would come up to speed. They'd work on it in Berlin, but in Germany, they actually had a working television model by 1935. And the idea was to get television working for the German people by the Olympics in 1936 to show off the athletic Germany that Hitler was thinking of and to make Germans proud of their national team. The first regular electronic television service began in Germany, March 22nd, 1935. That was in Berlin. And it was different from the uh, system that was being tried out in the United States. It had an 180 line system. It was on the air 90 minutes a week and it was on in 30 minute segments uh, back in 1935. But they were gonna get TV up to speed for the Olympics, the Summer Olympics in 1936, and they did. Uh, television was on in Berlin eight hours a day during the Olympics, also in Hamburg eight hours a day during the Olympics. But Germans didn't take uh, much interest in television. So the Nazis were going to use the 1936 Olympic Games all for propaganda promoting this new image of a new, strong, united Germany. But we're not going to talk about how we're taking rights away from Jews, from Romans, from homosexuals, from the opponents. And we're not going to talk about the Germany's growing mil militarism. This guy in the middle is Jesse Owens. Behind him is Jackie uh, Robinson's brother, Mac Robinson. Jesse Owens would ruin the party for Adolf Hitler by winning three gold medals. One of those gold medals that he won should have been won by Marty Glickman. During the 1936 Olympics, Germans were able to watch eight hours a day of the Olympics. But the televisions did not get to the people that they really wanted to. It didn't get to a mass quantity, it got to a small number of people. That guy on the left, that's Marty Glickman. He's 18 years old in 1936, and he's feeling quite good about himself in 1936, and for good reason, because Marty Glickman, Marty Glickman is the fastest kid in Brooklyn. No doubt, he's the fastest kid in Brooklyn. He could outrun anybody. He's going to Erasmus High School, and he could run, and he could run, and he could run, and he could run so fast, he tried out for the Olympic team. And guess what? He made the Olympic team. He's going to Germany in 1936. He's a brash 18-year-old know-it-all, as he once told me. He knew everything in the world. He was from Brooklyn. He was fast. 
The guy to the right of him, Sam Stoller, uh, I didn't know him as well as I knew Marty. I mean, I would see him every year because he ran the Milrose games uh, and I would be there. And he would not talk very much about his experience in Germany. Uh, in fact, he didn't talk about it at all. Uh, in the uh, movie called Race a couple of years ago, uh, the Jesse Owens, uh, the movie, it was kind of a biopic about Jesse Owens. They really didn't get the scene with Marty and Sam and Jesse and Ralph Metcalf totally correct. Uh, but Marty and Sam had gone to uh, Germany under thinking that they were going to run in the 4x4 100 relay. The day before the event, the two of them are replaced by Jesse Owens and Ralph Metcalf. They are the two fastest sprinters on the American team. There's a problem with Jesse Owens. Jesse Owens was an individual. Jesse Owens never ran a relay. Didn't know he even had a hand off the baton. Didn't do that. Didn't know how he was supposed to do that. Um, Marty talked about what happened the day before. And Marty said that the coach, Dean Cromwell, that was the coach of the track team, the coach, Dean Cromwell, and he said Avery Brundage were motivated by anti-Semitism. And they were looking to hatch a plot to spare the furor, the indignity, and the embarrassment of seeing two American Jews on the winning podium. Because Marty told me that he was going to take that gold medal and he was going to lift it up and he was going to shove it right in the Fuhrer's face. It was, he wasn't going to wear it around his neck. He was going to take it and hold it out like that, like that, so the Fuhrer could see that a Jew from Brooklyn won a gold medal. So Sam didn't think that it was anti-Semitism. He, he really didn't think that anti-Semitism was involved. It was, but he didn't think it. He was 21 years old at the time. I knew Marty. Marty at the time was born in uh, was born the same year as Cosell in 1918, so he'd be 102 years old. Well, I knew Marty. He was in his uh, 50s and 60s, and so was Sam in his 50s and 60s. And he didn't believe it was anti-Semitism, but he was 21 at the time in 1936, and he des described the incident in his diary as the most humiliating episode in his life which may be the reason that he never talked to me about it. Like I said, I knew more than, and Sam, and Sam never talked to me. Jesse Owens was replaced, uh, or replaced Marty. Marty said, we were shocked. Sam was completely stunned. He didn't say a word in the meeting. I was a brash 18 year old kid and I said, coach, you can't hide world-class sprinters. Then Jesse says something. He says, basically, let Marty and Sam race. Jesse spoke up. Coach said, I've won my three gold medals in the 100, 200, and long jump. I'm tired. I've had it. Those athletes, or in those days, in the 1930s, with the exception of Babe Ruth, who may be a boxer, athletes were supposed to be seen and not heard. And if you were Negro, Black, African American, you certainly weren't going to be heard. In fact, you had nothing to say, and you were devalued. You weren't supposed to say a word. Let Marty and Sam run. They deserve it, said Jesse. And Cromwell pointed his finger at him and said, you do as you're told. As Marty said, those days, black athletes, with the exception of maybe Paul Robeson, uh, black athletes did as they were told. Jesse was quiet after that. Jesse and Ralph Metcalf would compete, and uh, there they are. There are the four guys who won the gold medals with Jesse on the left and Ralph Metcalf next to him and uh, two other American runners. Uh, they were there, and they stayed there. They were named, and they won the gold medal. Two weeks before the Olympics, German officials told Gretel Bergman he didn't make the team even though she had equaled the Germans' women's record in the high jump, the Germans would sacrifice a chance to win a gold medal, and they got rid of Gretel Bergman. And there is Gretel Bergman. 1993, she's being honored 
it was a pre-Olympics. The Olympics, uh, the Winter Olympics, switched from the same year as the Summer Olympics to every other year. So it was a pre-1994 uh, Olympic luncheon at the New York Athletic Club. And uh, I was there, Mark Schneider, Associated Press reporter, the late Mark Schneider, one of my friends, uh, was there. And Gretel was there. And Gretel walks in. And I walk over to her and Marv comes with me and I look, Gretel, I introduce myself. I look at Gretel and I said, you know, 20 years ago, me, you, and showing him, Marv, I said, me, you, and him would not be allowed even in the lobby of this building. Although that's not quite true because the New York Yankees had a deal with the New York Athletic Club. And if you were part of the Yankees, you got into the Athletic Club. And Bob Fischel was the Yankee public relations director at that point. And Mel Allen, Mel Allen Israel was the Yankee announcer and his brother Larry Israel, Larry Allen was the statistician. So they did have memberships by proxy uh, to the New York Athletic Club. And Bob actually used the New York Athletic Club and told me that he used to get the dirtiest looks, the dirtiest looks, particularly after he worked out and took a shower. That's when he really got the dirty looks. And as Bob said one day to me, he said, they were looking for my horns. I said, okay. Anyway, so Gretel is there, and we go into the, uh, do our interviews. Me and Marv get Gretel off in a corner and doing our interviews. And I looked at Gretel, and I said, I, I just have one question, and it's a one, one word question. Very simple. Why? And she answered. She said, why? I did it for my people. Things were really, really bad in Germany. All of our rights were taken away. Everything was taken away. We're losing money. We're losing our businesses. We're thrown into these places. We're trying to escape as best we can. And I thought by continue, continuing to compete, continuing to compete, even though, even though I knew, I absolutely knew that I would never ever compete in the 1936 Olympics. I knew I had to go along with them because I had to give my people hope. I had to give them even the smallest of hope. I had to give them hope. And that's why I did it. I knew I never was going to compete in the 1936 Olympics. I knew that. I knew it from the get-go. But I did it because I wanted to show our people we needed some help. And we needed some hope. Uh, in uh, about 2002, HBO did a uh, special, one hour special, called Hitler's Pawn, P A W N, Hitler's Pawn, all about Gretel Bergman and how Gretel Bergman went along with the program until she couldn't. And I'll tell you a little more about Gretel in a minute. She said, I was the great Jewish hope. In 1937, Gretel Bergman was able to obtain papers that allowed her to immigrate to the United States. She came to New York with her then boyfriend, soon to be husband, Dr. Bruno Lambert, also an athlete, also Jewish, uh, with $10. They each had $10 in their pockets. It's all the money that the Germans would allow them to take for $20 to leave the country. She worked as a masseuse physical therapist, and she had hoped she would compete with, for the United States in the 1940 Olympics, four years older, but she thought she could do it. Uh, and that was her hope. I was the great Jewish hope. And when she left, she swore she would never go back to Germany, absolutely never go back to Germany. She had had it, and the United States was her new homeland. Uh, she continued to participate in sports, and she actually, in 1937, won the United States Women's High Jump Championships, uh, also 1938. She also won the 1937 Shot Put Championship. She married her boyfriend, Dr. Bruno Lambert, in 1938. She became a United States citizen in 1942. She never did compete in 1940, nor did she compete in 1944 because there were no Olympics. By the time the Olympics came back in 1948 in London, 
she was too old by that point. Um, and she didn't compete. And she became a footnote in history. She was totally forgotten. You know, Gretel Bergman was once a great athlete, but that was it. She was once a great athlete. She had a life in the United States along with Dr. Bruno Lambert. And that was it, never to be heard from again. So she fades into obscurity. But in Israel, there's a place called the Jewish Hall of Fame at the Wingate Institute in Israel. They looked into Gretel Bergman's story. She's now known as Margaret Lambert in the United States, taking her husband's name and goes back to her real name, which was Margaret. She was no longer called Gretel, which was a nickname. Uh, and by 1980, she's inducted into the uh, Jewish Sports Hall of Fame in Israel. And all of a sudden, Gretel Bergman comes back to life. So much so that by 1993, uh, the United States Olympic Committee decides to throw a party, and, uh, which I happen to go to at the New York Athletic Club, and they invite Gretel Bergman to this party. It's where I meet Gretel Bergman and talk to her about 1936. And I talked about all the years after 1936, because this is 1993, and it's well over 50 years by this point. And I said, did you ever go back to Germany? No, she didn't. She never went back to Germany. Ross Greenberg runs HBO, Michael Fuchs. And one of those families actually was a neighbor of my mother-in-law and my father-in-law back in the day. And uh, they convinced her, we want to do a special on you, but you have to go back to Germany and we have to go through your childhood in Germany. And uh, she did. In 1996, in the Atlanta, at the Atlanta Olympics, she got an honorary gold medal because Historians look back at the 1936 Olympics and looked at all of her records going into the 36 Olympics and deduced that she would have won a gold medal at the 1936 Olympics. Greenberg and Fuchs eventually would be able to convince Gretel Bergman, Gretel Bergman, Margaret Lambert, and maybe let's bring you back after 62 years. It's been 62 years. Why don't we go back to Germany? and why don't we do this special on you? And they did. And they go back to Lapham, where she used to train, and she found out that the stadium in Lapham was named after her in her honor. The HBO special did come, back in two, it did come out in 2004. I've seen the special, it's really good. And she died at the age of 103 in Forest Hills, which was her home for 80 years. She died at the age of 103 in 2017. And she was a feisty old woman until she reached 100 years old. She got her gold medal. She got her life in the United States. And she had a wonderful life, she told me, in the United States. And she eventually would go back to Germany. Blaine Meyer, that's the woman on the right giving the Hitler, Heil Hitler salute. Her father was Jewish. She competed for the German team in the 1936 Olympics. Now, we don't know very much about Helene Meyer. There's very little correspondence that she uh, left behind, didn't spend too much time writing uh, letters to too many people. And she died in California at a rather young age. She was in California, but not German. And nobody seems to know why. German authorities said the star fencer, Helene Meyer, could represent Germany at the 1936 Summer Games because she was viewed as a non-Aryan. Her mother wasn't Jewish, but her father was Jewish. But because her mother wasn't Jewish, she wasn't Jewish, so they said, which allowed her to compete in the 1936 Summer Games. She won a silver medal in the individual fencing uh, competition. And like all the other medalists for Germany, she gave the Nazi salute on the podium. There was no other athlete that competed for Germany in the 1936 Summer Olympics. In the 1936 Winter Olympics in Munich, there was an ice hockey player by the name of Rudy Ball who worked out a deal with the Germans. I'll play for you and then give me my release. I want out of this country. And he played for them and they followed up. 
Ball left and his family all left Germany uh, in 1936. But Mark competed for Germany in 1936. She died at a young age, she was 42. And uh, she did not uh, leave much correspondence behind. In fact, there are no film clips of her ever giving an interview. She never wrote a book. She fled to California. Why did she flee to California? I'm not sure. Uh, and nobody else seems to be sure. Uh, she would die of cancer. Uh, in 2000, Sports Illustrated named Belene Meyer the greatest woman fencer of the 20th century. The games itself, while well, Hitler was there all the time, was watching his uh, Germans, even though he wasn't German, he was from Australia, but he's watching his Germans uh, winning medals. But uh, that comes to a halting end because of this guy, Jesse Owens, winning a third gold medal and a fourth gold medal. And uh, during one of those gold medals, he turns Hitler's in the uh, box and he turns and discuss after Jesse Owens wins another medal. Jesse Owens is the big, big American hero. He shoves it right into the Fuhrer's face, but it's only temporary. You know, athletes today from the Olympics or winning championships end up at the White House. He ended up back in Ohio. He became a janitor. Nobody wanted to hire him. Uh, no ticker tape parades for Jesse Owens, no White House visit. In fact, he was shunned when he got back, even though he was the great hero. Uh, Mac Robinson, Jackie Robinson's brother, who won some silver medals at the Olympics, uh, he went back to Pasadena and he became a street cleaner, cleaned the streets. And one day he decided, you know what, I want to see what the uh, winning a silver medal was all about. And he put on his Olympic jacket, wore his medal while he's sweeping the streets, and locals were calling, complaining about this guy in an Olympic uniform wearing a silver medal cleaning the streets. They were upset that this guy was doing it. Mac Robinson was told by the police and by the people in Pasadena who hired them, listen, you know what? Nice protest, but clean the streets. Leave your Olympic uniform at home along with the medals. These guys came back to the United States. They were heroes for the day. They came back, they weren't heroes anymore. The 1936 Olympic legacy. Hitler had hoped that the 1936 Berlin Games would prove his theory of Aryan's racial superiority. Owens would win four gold medals in the 100 meters, 200 meters, the four by 100 relay, and the long jump. He got Marty Glickman's medal. Marty told me that. Marty wasn't bitter that Jesse got it. He was bitter that he didn't have the chance to get it. He set three world records, one of those was by replacing Marty in the four by 100 relay. Now the medals, the medals that went out that year, nine medals uh, ended up to people who were Jewish, Jewish uh, parentage, uh, including Meyer, five Hungarians, uh, seven Jewish male athletes from the United States, Marty and Sam Stoller went to Berlin. Uh, some Europeans also competed uh, Appear, uh, European Jewish European athletes, uh, and they were pressured uh, by Jewish organizations not to go to the games. But Marty Glickman said the reason he did go to the games was because he wanted to stuff it up. Hitler's, we'll leave it at that, uh, and he never got his opportunity to do so. Um, some of those five Hungarians would perish in concentration camps including a fencer whose last name was Endy, E-N-D-E, Endy, -E, uh, who would die in a concentration camp. Um, there were quite a few. The first, uh, one of the first was a, a Polish uh, fencer by the name of Roland, Roman Cantor. Uh, he would die in one of the camps. Uh, many Jewish athletes who competed in the Olympics prior to 1936 and lived in German controlled areas or in 1936 would die in the concentration camps during the Holocaust. Among them, Ija Zibberman, he was a Polish swimmer. Roman Cantor, he was a Polish fencer. Both competed in 1939 and would die in Medenic uh, at the concentration camp. Uh, HBO ended up doing two specials. Uh, Bergman, Hitler's Pawn, that was in 2004. And Glickman, all about Marty. 
guy I knew, still owes me money, owes me a hundred bucks for something I did with him. Uh, in 1988, that HBO movie came out in 2010. You probably don't know this guy, and there's no reason you should know this guy. Uh, his name is Wolfgang Furster, and he was the guy who was in charge of the Olympic Village, and he killed himself shortly after the 1936 Summer Olympics. And why? Well, they found out that he had Jewish blood in him. He was the vice commander of Berlin's Olympic Village during the 1936 Olympics. He committed suicide on August 19, 1936, three days after the Games ended. He was afraid that he was going to be caught. And he was afraid he was going to be caught, and they would find out that he had Jewish blood in him. So he took the, what he thought was the easy way out and committed suicide. Neville Chamberlain, Neville Chamberlain, appeasement. Appeasement. Hitler won whatever he needed to win on the world stage in 1936. He got other countries to look at him. He got other countries to go to Germany. And he got other countries to, whether liked him or not, they acknowledged that Germany existed. Avery Brundage, Avery Brundage, as it turned out, his construction company would do business with Adolf Hitler, and they would do it in Washington, D.C., and they would do it by building new office buildings for the official German government in Washington, D.C. in 1937. It was Brundage's construction company. Hitler, uh, rather, Chamberlain was looking for peace in his time. Hey, there were a bunch of good sports. They hosted both Olympics in 1936, in the winter in Munich and in the summer in Berlin. Hey, peace with honor. Neville Chamberlain uh, with his appeasement policy. Uh, as you know, a whole bunch of things happened after 1936. Uh, some of it not involving Germany. Sapporo, Japan was supposed to be the, uh, the first choice. It was the first choice for the 1940 Winter Olympics. It was selected in 1937, but a war broke out between the Chinese and the Japanese in 1937, which meant there was no, not going to be a 1940s Olympics uh, in Sapporo, Japan. Eventually, the International Olympic Committee had to figure out what to do. And they figured out, hey, let's put the Winter Olympics from 1940, we'll put it back in St. Moritz, uh, over in Switzerland. They can handle it. Switzerland said, no, time is running out to hold the 1940 Olympics. On January 9th, 1939, the International Olympic Committee gave the Winter Olympic Games to Germany. To Germany. Kristallnacht had already happened at this point. Things were getting really bad in Germany at this point. Yet the International Olympic Committee says, hey, you know what? Let's give the Winter Olympics, the 1940 Winter Olympics, to Munich. The Germans had invaded Australia. It was seven months after Kristallnacht. It was less than three months after German troops invaded parts of Czechoslovakia. Yet the International Olympic Committee, the, in, the International Olympic Committee, it's Austria, not Australia, Austria. It was three months. All of a sudden, let's give the Germans the Olympics. The Germans won the 1936 propaganda game, at least as far as the International Olympic Committee was concerned, at least as far as Avery Brundage was concerned. They got the games in 1940. There was a fascination by the International Olympic Committee, not only with Hitler, but with Mussolini. With Mussolini, 1944, Winter Games comes up. They don't have a 1940s games because of the war, but 1944. They give the 1944 Winter Olympics to Cortina di Ampezzo in Mussolini's Italy. They had a fascination with these guys. Part of it may have been because Francisco Franco, who was the fascist who ran Spain, was around. Maybe that had something to do with it, but Franco's a uh, secretary, um, Juan Antonio Samaranch, would eventually become 
the International Olympic Committee's chief executive officer. Neither Olympics took place uh, in 1940 or 44, which denied Marty a chance at um, the gold medal at the Summer Games in 40 and 44, denied Sam, they could have still done it probably in 1940, and denied Gretel Bergman. All those athletes were denied. In 1939, Germany invades Poland. September 1st, 1939, the start of World War II. No Olympics for Sam, none for, uh, no for Sam, no for Marty, no for Gretel. This guy is an interesting character. I'm sure none of you in here have ever heard of Alfred Nikenshi. Anybody here, if you did, just tell me in chat, because I'm sure that none of you ever heard of uh, Alfred. But he is a very, very interesting story, and in a sense, is a very heartwarming story. Uh, he was a swimmer for France. He competed for France in the 1936 Games. Came in fourth as part of the 4x200 relay, missed the bronze medal by six seconds. In 1941, he's still swimming for France. There are still competitions. He set a world record for the 200 meter uh, breaststroke. He beat out the German champion. He was a German, he was a Jewish swimmer, even though he was from France. And um, he was criticized and he couldn't enter some races. France's leading swimmer said, we can't deal with this. We're going to protest. We're not showing up at these races during World War II if Alfred can't compete. Didn't compete, they didn't show up. Of course, he's in France, and the Germans occupy France. 1944, he, his wife, and his two-year-old daughter were all arrested and deported to Auschwitz. Of the 1,368 men, women, and children who made the journey by train, only 47 of them survived. One of them was Alfred. Both his wife and daughter were killed at Auschwitz. He was at Buchenwald when he was liberated. And less than a year after his liberation at Buchenwald, he went back to swimming. And he was good at it, even though he spent a year in a concentration camp. He's part of the French team in 1946 that set a world record in the 300 by 100 relay. Also that year, he became the French national champion at the butterfly and in the 400, 4 by 100 relay. An amazing, amazing physical specimen. Lost his wife, lost his daughter, spent time in the concentration camp, and by 1948, he does what Marty couldn't do, what Sam couldn't do, what Grell couldn't do. 12 years after the Berlin Olympics, he's in the London Olympics. And he did rather well in the London Olympics. Uh, in the London Olympics, he swam the 200 meter breaststroke, reached the semifinals, and he was also a member of France's water polo team. Um, not too many people talk about Alfred Nanichi anymore, but he, his story is absolutely amazing in the annals of Olympic history. In 1971, Avery Brundage was interviewed. Munich gets the Olympics in 1972. And Brundage is doing an interview. And Brundage is talking about what's going to happen uh, in Munich in 1972. And the interviewer says to uh, Brundage, I've got a question for you. What was the finest Olympics you ever witnessed? Do you want to, want to know his answer or do you want to guess his answer? The answer is, the 1936 Summer Olympics was the finest Olympics Avery Brundage ever attended. Now, you got to remember, Brundage was part of the American First Committee with Charles Lindbergh and with Joe Kennedy and a whole bunch of others. John Kennedy also was a member of the American First Committee. Uh, he did business with the Fuhrer, built him some buildings in Washington. And so why not? Why wouldn't it be the best Olympics he ever witnessed? September of 1972, the Munich 11. Nine athletes, two Israelis were killed. 
the first time Americans saw terrorism in their houses was watching ABC's coverage of the Olympics and listening to Jim McKay, the Munich massacre. Wasn't the massacre quite yet. Black September elements got into the Olympic village and broke into the Israeli compound in the village. The day of terror begins at 4.30 in the morning local time, 10.30 at night in New York. On September 5th, 1972, eight Palestinian militants affiliated with Black September, which was an offshoot of the Palestinian group Fatah, which is an offshoot of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, of which Yasser Arafat was the head at that time, scale fences surrounding the Olympic Village in Munich. They were described as athletes and using stolen keys, they forced their way into the quarters of the Israeli Olympic team. Black September actually started in Jordan in 1970 and there were skirmishes between Fatah and other groups, Palestinian groups and the Jordanians. Eventually the Jordanians would kick the Palestinians out of the country by 1971. Uh, they went to Syria and then ended up in Lebanon. That is the a brief history of Black September. Do a lot with them in my 1970 talk. Um, anyway, and they tried to assassinate uh, the Jordan King, King Hussein, twice in September of 1970, Black September group. The end game comes around 10 o'clock on September 5th. Believing uh, that uh, there was an agreement between the Germans and the terrorists, the terrorists leave the Olympic village. Uh, the athletes are bound and blindfolded. They go into buses and they're transported into helicopters waiting for them to go to the airport. That is Jim McKay, Jim McManus, Jim McKay, Baltimore, Maryland. He's a newspaper guy, Baltimore Sun, made it into TV. In fact, uh, he was a host of a Goodson Todman uh, game show in the 1950s that didn't go anywhere, ends up on ABC, the wide world of sports, with Rune Arledge. And he is the anchor of the uh, Olympic coverage uh, and the Munich massacre. How it Cosell? Told you I know Cosell's uh, grandkids, Colin and uh, Justin. Justin has come to a couple of my talks. And uh, Howard, 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 Howard wanted to be where Jim McKay was. Howard wanted to be the anchor. Because as Howard told me once, I was Jewish. I knew I was Jewish. I grew up in Brooklyn. He was born in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And uh, Howard said that uh, the Irish kids used to chase him down Easton Parkway in Brooklyn. So he knew what it was like to be persecuted. Now Howard, I don't know if you knew this about Howard, a couple things. Howard was six foot three. Howard towered over me, and I'm six feet. So Howard towered over me, and he was also a Marine sergeant. He's a sergeant in the Marines. So Howard was no lemish, but he was telling me how he was intimidated by the Irish kids. Jim McManus was a fine broadcaster, but it should have been me telling the world what was going on. Probably better off than it was in Howard, knowing Howard. Um, McKay is on, and he's on for 14 straight hours. Howard actually did some stuff at the Olympics. He and Peter Jennings were two of the main reporters that were actually uh, covering what was going on. At 3 a.m. local time, 9 o'clock New York time, McKay is on for 14 straight hours. And McKay was relaxing when they told him, you've got to get on the air. He wasn't even wearing pants. He was wearing a swimsuit. Uh, because he was swimming. They threw a shirt on him and a tie and the jacket, and he was there for 14 hours. And uh, he summarized the uh, outcome, the botched rescue at the airport where uh, the German officials were trying to rescue the hostages, and some of the Palestinians had grenades on them, and they blew themselves up with the uh, hostages in the uh, helicopter. And McKay ends his broadcast they're all gone. The failure. German authorities never did storm Building 31. 
they allowed the terrorists to take the hostages by helicopter to a nearby airbase. The Germans bungled the ambush and rescue operation. They didn't know how to do it. And they forgot to disarm the Palestinians who were on the helicopters with the uh, Israeli athletes and coaches. The nine Israeli hostages were killed by a combination of terrorist gunfire and a hand grenade that one of the Palestinians set off in the helicopter as it sat on the ground. It was over after 20 hours. 11 Israelis killed, one Munich policeman killed, five black September, uh, September terrorists were killed, three of the gunmen were captured. Howard, Howard was there. And Jim McKay stole his glory, but he would make up for that in 1976. He'd make up for that. Don't worry about Howard. He knew how to make up for everything. We have an immense flurry of action here, Cosell told Peter Jennings. Police in platoon-like numbers are staging in front of us. Howard would never, ever give you a simple explanation. An immense flurry of action here. Police in platoon-like numbers are staging in front of us. That was Howard. But he was there and he did some, and he did a good job actually of reporting in the field. Uh, Richard Nixon, uh, I knew, I, I knew him. Uh, I did know him. I covered him in 1985 when he settled the uh, dispute between major league owners and baseball umpires, and I covered that. And that was when Nixon would be returned to uh, life as a senior statesman. And uh, I sat in his office with Gene Orser and uh, Arthur Shack from the Baseball Players Association. They told me to come down with them. And uh, we all did this in his seat. And if we had this back in the day, the cell phone, I'd have 100 selfies of myself going like that in Richard Nixon's seat. But he's very angry at uh, Avery Brundage and the International Olympic Committee. He sends a telegram to Avery Brundage and demands that the rest of the 1972 Munich Summer Olympics be called off. Brundage is having none of that. In fact, Brundage uh, would give a talk. The talk was supposed to memorialize the Israeli athletes, remember what was going on or what happened with the Black September terrorists, but uh, not Avery, not Avery, not him at all. It was a pet talk that the games must go on. Uh, at the memorial service on September 6th, the games must go on. He announced that the games would continue. Uh, he um, spent 21 words, 21 words, our Israeli friends. Jim Murray, the superb Los Angeles uh, Times columnist who is nearly blind, nearly blind, but he did see what he had to see enough to write, talked about how obscene it was to hear Avery Brundage uh, talk about the games as if he was selling it and only the 21 uh, words to the Israeli uh, athletes and coaches who, was, uh, who were killed. So 1939 games, according to Brundage, the finest ever. And Brundage remains to this day a central character in the German Olympics history. Now Mark Spitz, Mark Spitz was the guy who won all the gold medals in swimming that year. And in 1999, I had a chance to sit down with Mark Spitz. This is not me talking, this is Mark Spitz. I transcribed the interview, and it's up on the board for you to read it. Uh, the Jewish-American swimmer Mark Spitz, who had set a record of winning seven gold medals, was spurted out of Munich to London in fear he would be a target of other terrorists. In fact, we talked about how uh, Mark and I in 1999, how he might have been a high-value target. And he talked about this news conference that was celebrating Spitz's achievement how it was canceled. And again, this is not me, this is Mark Spitz. The swimming program had stopped. I swam all my events in that evening. The last competition was on Monday and this happened on the Tuesday morning. Swimming was through so I didn't have to compete anymore. I had a press conference right afterwards on Tuesday. That's when everyone told me about this Israeli tragedy or the thing that was happening at the time hadn't turned into a major tragedy at the moment, at least at that time. They didn't know much about it. The next day, I was whisked out. They got him out. They got him out because they were worried about him being the next one who was gonna be kidnapped. 
And he got home and he won all the gold medals and did all of uh, the things that you do when you win all the gold medals. Never went back to dental school or never went to dental school because that's what he originally wanted to be, a dentist. And he's lived off living all those gold medals in Southern California since then. Brundage had the 27 world tribute to our Israeli friends. 27 words. That was it. The games must go on. Brundage, who was the International Olympic Committee, he really was the International Olympic Committee, but he would be ousted after this. Uh, the IOC ordered the competition to resume after a pause of 34 hours. How they got 34 hours, I can't tell you, but it was a morning period of 34 hours. Howard Cosell, Howard Cosell once told me and everybody else who was around to listen to Howard Cosell, which were a lot of people, that uh, Avery Brundage came of age uh, during the time of William of Orange in the Netherlands. And uh, I was on a cruise one, one year and we went through the Netherlands and we went up to Delft. And I started laughing, looking at this bar and cafe in uh, Delft, William of Orange. And I sent that picture to Colin and to uh, uh, Justin. I said, look what you look what Papa, they called Howard Papa, look what Papa could have gone to. And they laughed and they said, you must have really known my, our Papa well, that you could have a joke over the William of Orange uh, uh, cafe. But uh, Howard did not like Avery Brundage. He was around the, the Olympic movement and he said, uh, Avery Brundage must have come of age during the time of William of Orange, who was a really bad guy in the Netherlands. Um, there was no memorial in the 1976 Olympics as we wrap this thing up. Uh, the, in Montreal, uh, the Montreal Olympics, which was boycotted by 22 African American countries because of apartheid in uh, South Africa, uh, New Zealand played a, uh, a South African team in rugby. Uh, the African countries demanded that New Zealand would be kicked out. They weren't kicked out, so the African American countries boycotted the games. The Israeli team entered the stadium in Montreal, the Big O, with a black ribbon on the national flag. The United States International Olympic Committee never, ever, ever acknowledged the massacre. In the year 2012, they refused to honor the slain athletes and coaches on the 40th anniversary of the uh, Munich Games during the London Summer Olympics. But something happened during those Summer Olympics. Comcast had taken over NBC. And Bob Costas was the announcer or the host of the Olympics, as he was for quite a few Olympics. And Bob Costas, in, in 2012, talked about how it was horrible that the Olympic Committee did not, did not, on the 40th anniversary, pay homage to what happened in 1972. Now, that could only come with the approval of NBC, because NBC was funding the International Olympic Committee. Comcast took over, and Brian Roberts and the Roberts family was the head of Comcast. They competed the year earlier in the Maccabee Games in Israel. So there's no doubt in my mind, although I never, I haven't seen Bob to ask him about this, no doubt in my mind that Costas went by, went announced or came up with whatever he came up with. And he had to have Brian Roberts' approval somehow. And the Olympic Committee heard that. And they know NBC through 2032 is the big, big sponsor of the Olympics in terms of television money, media money. So Bob did that. 2016, 2016, 2016, things changed. Those are two of the widows of two of the slain Israeli athletes, hugging Thomas Bach, the head of the International Olympic Committee. Because in 2016, 44 years after the event, the Olympics finally recognized what happened in 1972. But being that this is the International Olympic Committee, and being that they can't 
do the right thing the right way, they came up with this plan that everybody who was killed while competing during the Olympics would be honored in 2016. There was one other person killed during the Olympics and it had nothing to do with terrorism, nothing to do with a political state, and nothing to do with Olympic stupidity because there's an event called the Luge and they wanted to make those who were competing in the Luge go faster and faster and faster and faster. And there was an athlete from the country of Georgia who went too fast, lost control, and got killed on the course. So the 11 athletes had to share this honor with this guy who was killed during the 2016 Vancouver Olympics. They couldn't even do it the right way for the Olympics because that's the International Olympic Committee. Uh, one of the widows said that it finally brought closure to the families in 2016. And there's a permanent exhibit in uh, Rio de Janeiro honoring those slain Olympians. There's also a plaque in Munich that was put up by local people commemorating who was killed during the 1972 Olympics. And there is Thomas Bach signing the decree in Rio de Janeiro in 2016, commemorating 12 people, nine Israeli athletes, two Israeli coaches, and one luge athlete from Georgia. He could have been honored 2014, the fourth anniversary of the 2010 Olympics, but they did. Germany has never held another Olympics, although they've tried. They've tried, and local voters have said no. In fact, Munich in 2022, voters in Bavaria said no. It came out, it was called the Munich Massacre. People massacred the Olympics. Now, before I end this, I'm going to talk about the 2036 Olympics. And by the way, that was a local newspaper the Munich massacre, obviously forgetting what happened 19, in 1972. Now I'm gonna leave you with this. Right now, Germany is trying to get the 20, uh, 2032 Olympics in an 11th city area out uh, by Frankfurt and all. But there are some people in Germany, in Berlin, who want the 2036 Olympics in Berlin. And they want the 2036 Olympics because they want to teach people a history lesson, so they claim. And they want to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Hitler Olympics, and they want to talk about propaganda and how Hitler used propaganda to manipulate people in the 1936 Olympics. That at least is their stated goal. Like I said, there are people out in uh, Westphalia, uh, in, uh, in the Rhine, who want the Olympics in 2032. But there are some people who think it is the right thing to have the 2036 Olympics, the 100th, 100th anniversary of the Hitler Olympics in Berlin. And I am going to leave it at that without an opinion. But if you have an opinion, I will gladly answer you or, or I will gladly listen to you. Thank you so much. Thank you to Paul for uh, bringing me in to talk about the Olympics. This was supposed to be a talk which was on the eve of the opening of the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, which was supposed to start on July 24th, which obviously has been postponed uh, for a year, they say, because of the COVID-19 virus. Uh, that's the pandemic around the world. So thank you, Paul. Thank you for all of you who have come today to listen to this talk. And um, I'll open the floor for anybody who wants